Good morning. My name is Barbara Fuller, and as chair of the board, I welcome you to this September 20th, 2022 working session of the Washtenaw County Board of Road Commissioners. Our communications manager, Emily Kaiser, will describe how these meetings operate, how to access the agenda, and how people may participate remotely. Emily. Thanks, Commissioner. There are multiple ways to make public comment during today's meeting, whether you're joining us in person or virtually. If you're here in person and would like to make public comment, please fill out the sign-in sheet now. If you are joining us virtually, you can we will ask you to virtually raise your hand at the appropriate time in the agenda. If you're joining us virtually, the chat feature on the Zoom meeting is available only as technical support for users on their computer or smartphone. If you're experiencing technical issues with audio or video during the meeting, please submit a comment in the chat and I will help you troubleshoot. If you're a staff member experiencing issues, please contact the IT help desk for assistance. The audio and video of this meeting is being recorded. A link to the video recording will be posted to wcroads.org in the coming days. There are printed copies of today's working session agenda on the table here, and it's also posted on wcroads.org. There's a link available in the chat if you're joining us from your computer or smartphone. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Emily. I will officially call this meeting to order at this time and would ask Aaron to call the roll. Chair Barb Fuller. Present. Vice Chair Rod Green. Present. Commissioner Douglas Fuller. Present. Commissioner Gloria Yamas is just running late, but she'll be in attendance. Um, Commissioner Joanne McCollum. Present. Um, and the following directors are in attendance. Um, Managing Director Cheryl Siddle. Director of Engineering and County Highway Engineer Matt McDonald. Director of Operations Adam Lape. And Director of Finance and IT Dan Ackerman. Thank you, Erin. Uh, the first item on our agenda is public participation. This is the time set aside on the agenda to receive comments from the public. This is not intended to be a period for dialogue. Each person will be allotted three minutes to address the board. Emily Kaiser will now explain how people may be recognized to offer comments. Emily? Thanks, Commissioner. Um, so since this is a hybrid meeting with both in-person and virtual attendees, we'll take turns between those attending in-person and those attending virtually. For virtual attendees, we ask that you virtually raise your hand now. If you're viewing the meeting on your computer, first make sure to click join audio. You can then raise your hand by clicking the participants or reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then the raise hand button. If you dialed into the meeting from your touchtone phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine. I will unmute virtual participants with raised hands one at a time. I'll announce your username or the last four digits of your phone number when it is your turn to speak. Please share your name and address before beginning your comments. For in-person attendees, we'll start with those of you who signed up on the sign-in sheet as you walked in. If you didn't sign in, you're still welcome to make comment. I'll notify you when it is your turn. At this time, commissioners, we don't have anybody uh, with a raised hand or on the sign-in sheet. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we will move on with our agenda, and I will turn it over to our managing director, Cheryl Siddle, to take it away. Well, good morning. Um, I am pretty much going to turn it over to Dan Ackerman first, who is our Director of Finance and IT. And then we have Chris Quinter here, our IT manager, to do an update um, on our, the status of our IT. So, Dan? Good morning, Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, and just really excited about together for you. Just a, um, all uh, data store is a really um, so I just want Going back to 2018, uh, we had some challenges with our IT, mm -hmm. and um, we we talked to the board that kind of felt we were underinvesting in, in our IT and our infrastructure and the programs that we had, um, just about everything, and um, wanted to get a commitment from the board to help us invest in everything to, to really get it to a level that uh, staff would be able to have all the tools that they needed at their disposal. Fortunately, the board was uh, acceptable with that, and we made significant investments over the years, which we're definitely very appreciative of that. Um, but along with that, we need to put, uh, we need to have good people to help manage that change. And so Chris Quinter and Josh Summerhill, as well as our managed service provider, were, were the, the people that we needed to help move things forward. 
they just they brought a uh, a professional approach. They're helping us follow best practices. Um, they're helping uh, manage our users. Our help desk is fantastic as far as uh, allowing users to communicate what the issues are. Uh, closure rates are extremely low where I, I joke instead of days, it's hours. Mm -hmm. um, but that just shows the level of commitment that uh, Chris and Josh have to it. They're very patient, which probably all of you have experienced. Um, More than once. Yes. <laughs> and I can't tell you the number of times I've heard compliments about Chris, Chris and Josh Again, how professional they are. They're very quick. Every problem that users have there, you know, is their problem. And I think there's not a problem that they that hasn't that's existed that they haven't had solutions for. And sometimes Chris will have several solutions. So it just it's it's really amazing and very impressive. And um, you know, that that just helps to um, you know, almost win the hearts and minds of our users. And, and I feel like um, they've been able to do that. And not just at this location, but, um, you know, if you're in one of the outside yards, you're, you're equally as important. And they'll, they'll uh, address every, every problem, every user equally. Uh, Josh is at the Southeast Service Center trying to help with a few things right now. Um, he might be joining us, but, um, you know, again, you know, just, just so impressive. Um, you know, everything they've done to, um, you know, just kind of move us forward. Um, so Chris's presentation, besides an overview, he'll talk to you about a lot of the projects that we've accomplished in this past year. And there are several small and large projects. And the thing I've always been impressed with is Chris and Josh, they have a great plan. Um, they're, they're planners, which is awesome. And they, they kind of map things out. If training is needed, they provide great training for our users. And then usually it's a very smooth transition, which, which is awesome. Sometimes people don't even notice some of these things because it's just such a smooth transition um, and, and the projects are accomplished so well. And certainly there, there have been some external factors, supply chain issues that we've had, of course. Sometimes we've had a vendor or two that maybe required a little, little more management, but um, you know, certainly we've, we've gotten through uh, just about everything. Um, just want to talk as far as projects. One of the things that I'm most proud of is the boardroom here. And, um, you know, we went through some awful times with the pandemic. Um, hopefully we never have to go through anything like that again, but certainly in challenging times, hopefully there's things we can learn. And certainly as an organization, we've learned a lot of things as far as take your laptops and work from home and uh, be as efficient as you can. You know, using Zoom and Teams, um, you know, just all these wonderful tools that we, we fortunately now have at our disposal to make us as efficient as possible. I know from my standpoint, if there was ever an, an issue in, in finance, I tried to never use the pandemic as an excuse. And I unfortunately have heard that in doing business with a lot of other agencies. And, you know, if there was an issue or a failing tried not to use that as an excuse because again, we had all the technology to be extremely efficient even when we were all sent home. Um, and I think one of the other things we've learned as far as doing business during a pandemic is um, to be able to offer that virtual option to our citizens so they can still participate remotely um, in the board uh, working sessions or board meetings. Um, you know, I, I think that's one thing we found that that citizens like that option. Certainly, you know, they, they're more welcome to come in person now. But um, I think with with our busy lives, say somebody at their lunch hour, you know, from their from their desk or their car or wherever, they they can they can join in our board meeting. They can participate. They can ask questions. You know, and sadly, a lot of government agencies have kind of gone back to no, nope, we're just going in person, and that's the only option we have. And you know, so are they learning some of the lessons from the pandemic, which again, I, I'm, I'm really proud that we're still able to offer that virtual component um, to our citizens. And I, and I just think it makes it stronger for us as an organization, um, open and transparent, right? That, that's uh, a great way to be even more open and transparent as opposed to forcing people to come in person. So, you know, I'm glad that some of these lessons learned that we have um, that we're still practicing them today. And certainly this, this, the boardroom project here allows that to, to happen. Um, 
So I was just talking to Chris yesterday, uh, as far as IT is concerned, we're in a pretty good spot as far as the, the technology we have for staff and all the systems that we have in place. And I think one of the things we need to do is, is look at, provide maybe more training and, and more effectively use the tools. So help our users um, you know, know, know what's available for them or help with procedures or you know, maybe setting things up. But I think you know, that's gonna be another goal is we've got all this great technology. Are we using it to our fullest potential? And Chris and I were just kind of talking about some of the ways to make that happen. Um, you know, certainly providing training will, will be key to that. Um, and as I've mentioned before, just because we feel like we're in a good place doesn't mean we're, we're done with any IT investments or, um, you know, making any changes because fortunate, unfortunately or fortunately, technology is changing daily. And so we want to make sure if there are other improvements we can make. Um, that we're looking into that. So certainly, um, you know, I caution the board, uh, there'll, there'll be more projects, there'll be more investments we want to make, but we want to continue to move forward. And again, to, you know, this allows staff to uh, be as efficient as possible. And um, that's the other thing about Chris is he's always looking ahead. What's the next thing? What's the next challenge security wise? Um, you know, trying to stay one step ahead of all of that. And, um, and I think as an agency, it definitely benefits us to continue to move forward. So um, like I said, just wanted to make a couple opening remarks and now I'm pleased to, to turn things over to Chris Winter and he's gonna go through his presentation. Thank you, Dan. Morning, uh, Morning Chris Winter, IT Manager. Thank you, Dan, uh, for that introduction. Um, we had a really exciting year um, and I'm, I'm excited to share it with you here. So um, I have a lot of information that I wanted talk about this morning, um, kind of the overview that I'll be going through. We'll do an overview of, the, of our infrastructure first, and then go through all of our completed projects that we did this year, um, some of the projects that are still ongoing, and then what we're looking forward to in 2023. So um, I'm going to go to a pretty good clip because there's a lot in here, but please interrupt me if you have any questions or comments. Um, firstly, so for our infrastructure, this slide may look familiar. It's exactly the same as it was last year. Uh, we didn't really make any changes to our main rack or anything or any of our um, core backbone type uh, equipment. So we still have the two, the two redundant firewalls. Um, so those are the white um, devices there on the right. Um, the, the idea there is that if one of those sort of fail, the second one would pick it back up. Um, and, and that's important because all of our outside yards run through this yard for internet connectivity. Hmm. So it's an extra, extra security level um, to run those yards through here um, to get through our firewall. Uh, we still are using our Comcast dedicated fiber line. We installed that in August of 2020. So essentially 99% of the time, this building has an internet connection. At some point, we would like to look to a secondary internet connection. Um, just for that brief amount of time, if there is an interruption, um, there was a time earlier this year where the line was cut um, up on Miller, Miller Road, I believe it was. Um, those small instances can cause an internet outage in this building. Um, so at some point in the future, we'd like to entertain bringing in a second internet line for that purpose. Um, and then the last item on this slide, we did run a, a fiber line out to our shop as well at this yard. Um, so that the shop being about 400, 450 feet away from our server room was a little too long for a standard cat cable. So we ran a fiber line out there and have an, a secondary switch out there for, to improve their connectivity. Moving over to, across the hall to our server room, we still use our hybrid converge infrastructure. So essentially what this is, is it's for large servers that are able to run several virtual servers on them. Um, they, the way that works is also for redundancy. If one of those were to crash or have a hardware failure, um, say that top one there, number one, if it were to go down for any reason, those virtual machines or those virtual servers would automatically move to one of the other physical machines and there would be no noticeable outage or anything like that. At the bottom of that rack, we have our battery backup, just to make sure those stay up during a power outage. Um, the battery backup is not to, the purpose of that is not to really keep that up the entire outage. Um, it's really just to give us a appropriate time to shut those down correctly instead of just an abrupt outage. Um, but we are lucky in this building that we have a big generator outside. So when that happens, the power is only out for you know a couple minutes at most. 
So really what all those, those battery backups are doing is just maintaining the servers until that generator kicks in. Um, and the last thing on this slide, we did switch managed service providers last year. Previously, we were with dominant systems. Um, we switched over to, at the time, what was applied, um, applied solutions, um, and then net a subset being NetSmart. They have since rebranded to applied innovations. Um, they're out of Grand Rapids, and then they have a Livonia location as well. Um, so what they're, the purpose of them, um, they're really my backup. Um, they're our network engineers. Um, they've had a team of you know five or six guys that when we run into some really major issues, they're the ones that step in and help me with that. Um, they're also monitoring after hours and things like that. Any questions on some on the infrastructure of the overview so far? Yeah. The Manchester yard, just because it's sure probably because it's near my house. Away. <laughs> because it's near your house. There we go. Um, when it has a unlikely power outage because they're not provided by DTE, they have more reliable power sources. But in the unlikely event that they lose power, their computer system gets power from us, do they not? Or not? I can't speak to how the power is provided. Okay. Um, what I can speak to is if, if they lose power, their network does go down out there. Okay. Um, but the foreman there has a SIM card in his laptop that he can then connect through Verizon to get into our network still. So he's, he's still able to perform his okay. duties. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. McCollum. Yes. Um, with all the... Um, it firewalls and things like that. What's the probability of us getting hacked? There's there's always a probability, right? There, it's, nothing is ever foolproof. Um, I'll, I'll get into more of this. I have a security section that we can get more into. Um, but essentially, we have we have a double firewall, and then we have um, on our VPN connections, we have two factor authentication. So whenever somebody connects from a remote yard, it brings the the confirmation of the phone says, "Is this really you connecting?" And then they yes. Um, so that certainly helps in, in that instance. So uh, I will never say we are foolproof from being attacked, but the chances are there. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Green. What is the function of the core switch? So the core switch is actually in this picture here. Right. Um, and let's see if I can draw here. It is this section right there. So the core switch is what kind of relays that internet connection to all the offices and any components in the building. So if you follow along on the picture here, the internet comes in up here at the top, it then runs through the firewall, and then it comes down to the switch. So the switch then is plugged into all of these, which are all the office connections. So all the cubicles, all the offices, um, security cameras, anything that needs a network connection is plugged into this rack somewhere. So what the switch does is it relays that internet to all those devices. Thank you. Hmm? Okay, so moving on, um, kind of kind of contributes to your question, uh, Commissioner McCollum, for a backup and disaster recovery purpose, we did change this year. One of our big projects was changing our, the way we do backups. So previously we would back up to a device in our server room upstairs at this yard, and then overnight, that data would be relayed over to our Southeast Service Center um, to another device in that server room out there. We have since changed that. So now data is still replicated to a new device at this yard, but then in the evenings, it's relayed to the cloud hosted by the, the application that we use. Um, a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a little more secure. Um, if the network were to be hacked, that cloud does not exist on our network anywhere. Um, whereas the one at Southeast still did, right? We had it blocked for the most part, but there's still that, that tunnel to get to it. If someone were to, if the, an attacker were to find their way into our network, they would still have a way to get out to that, to those backups. So if we were to have a ransomware attack or they've encrypted our data, they could essentially grab our backups because the, the solution to a ransomware attack is to wipe the system and restore from a backup. Um, so what this allows us to do is pull that data down from the cloud um, it's much, much more difficult for an attacker to get to that data. The other thing the system allows us to do is actually image our servers up in the cloud. 
So if we do have an issue, like I mentioned earlier, if, if a server crashes or we need to re-image it or, or uh, reconfigure it in, for any reason, we can direct our users to use that cloud version of the server instead. So there's no interruption for our staff. It's very cool. We actually did this earlier this year. Um, we had a script that tried to patch our servers overnight. It went very wrong um, and crashed several of our virtual servers. We were down for a couple hours until Dan and I decided, yep, we need to go to our virtual servers. And nobody really noticed a difference. We were able to switch to those and then take our time making the corrections to the servers that were affected by the bad script. So, um, and then in the evening, I think we were on those for two, two or three days. And then overnight, one night, we switched them back and copied the data back over. And luckily, none of our staff even noticed that we were doing that. So this is pretty scary, Chris. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, some some of the technology we have now is, is very cool. <laughs> I, and this is a very high level overview, but I am happy to show you around upstairs and show you the nuts and bolts anytime. So, um, but we do have a lot of data that's being backed up. So the way our backups work. Um, with the old system, they would back up once a night. With the new system, they're backing up every hour during the business day. So from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., it's going to capture everything new. So in the morning, it's at, starting at 8 a.m., it's only going to capture anything that's changed since the previous day at 6 p.m. So it's not copying, as you see here, all four and a half terabytes every single hour. It's only grabbing the new stuff. And then it'll, it'll replicate that data um, up to the cloud in the evening. Questions at all? Okay. So touching on security, um, we, we do have a firewall at each yard. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, this yard has two, just in case the one goes down. Um, and the reason for that is if it does go down, all of our yards lose internet. Um, so we have a redundancy here at this yard. We're always watching and monitoring phishing attempts. So we get alerts right away um, if, if someone's account has been hacked or infiltrated in any way. Um, and then our equipment, all of our equipment's behind locked doors. Um, the server room is actually behind two locked doors. Um, our phone system or the phone connections down in the basement are all behind a, a locked door as well. So I have a question. Sure. I don't need to know the days or the times, but how many test messages have you sent out to see if we're paying attention on junk mail and sure. phishing? And Every... Every staff member with a road commission email account receives one a month. Thank you. And and it, the results have been very good so far. Um, we it, as you all did our cybersecurity training, right. and we'll, we'll get into that as well. But our cybersecurity training that we did last month, um, I think I really think that helps a lot to try to open people's eyes to oh, there's a lot of ways that this could happen. Um, and we do start to see people kind of fall for those messages the longer we get away from the training. We saw a few, actually in July, we probably had the most we ever had, which was three. So numbers are very low, but we do start to see those kind of increase um, leading up to the training that we do every year. So, so percentage-wise, how are people doing in terms of identifying them and reporting them? They're, they're doing excellent. Okay. Um, Percentage-wise, it's probably less than 5%. Um, we've only had, in the last year, I think four people actually click on it and their account would have been hacked. And what, what's great about it too, the way the system works is if you do go through and provide your credentials and, and if it were a real hacking temp, it does tell you, looks like you were spoofed. This is what you may have fallen for. Um, and it gives you a couple of training videos right there too to, to try to follow and kind of educate you on how that could have happened. Hmm. Go ahead. Chris, would you mind sharing that, um, especially for the commissioners and some of the directors that we are often ones that they are attempting to at least look sure. like they're sending emails on, on our behalf or they're trying to access our accounts. Sure. Yeah. And, and this is this is really the same with any major organization, right? The, the hackers will look for the head of the organization or heads in this case and try to impersonate you the most. Um, the reason for that is they're going to impersonate you and then send an email to staff saying, hey, you know, I'm... Commissioner Fuller, I need you to go buy gift cards immediately and get them back. That's something we see a lot. Um, the intent there is that that staff member, they're, they're hoping that that staff member won't bat an eye. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Fuller wants me to do this. I'm going to do it. Here you go. I follow your instructions. So unfortunately, those in this room, directors and commissioners, are the most attempted att hacking attempts that we see, um, which is why we're always watching it, right? We're 
every month we're going through and we're, we're manually going in and pulling results, seeing where successful login attempts have been made, which is nice. We can see actually the city that it's, that it's made in. Um, it's, it's a really helpful tool. So we can see all the, what's, what's really key is we can see all the failed attempts too. Um, and that's really what tells us, yeah, someone's really trying to get into this account. And by trying, they're just either having a computer program sitting there trying to punch in a password or they're sitting there doing it themselves, um, but they're unsuccessful. So the other thing we've implemented is multi-factor authentication on those accounts as well. And you all have it on yours. Um, this group was the first to have that implemented for that reason. So whenever you sign into your email account, you get that prompt on your phone, you need this code. So that'll really kind of help um, diverge those hacking attempts as well. Um, and then the finance department, uh, it's very commonplace to receive an email supposedly from an employee that, hey, I'm, ch I'm changing my direct deposit information. Can you please update my bank account information? No, no, no. There are some times where you need paper. So we, we make sure we have a particular form mm -hmm. that someone needs to fill out and hand it to payroll to say, yes, I want to change my bank account information or vendors. You know, you'll get uh, an email from a vendor saying, um, you know, we, we recently closed a bank account, you know, here's our new bank account. Nope, we've got a form that they actually fill out, you know, an approved form and approved method in order to make those type of changes. So, you know, really in finance, we take all that very seriously and we make sure that um, we follow a process and, you know, you, you, you can't just get an email and some of that was in the training, of course, too. You can't just get an email and say, hey, I need, you know, you need to change the ACH information. You know, we need to verify, we need to use our proper forms and so on. So we, we take that very seriously. Just want to share that. Thanks, Dan. No end to the creativity. There really isn't. And, and to Dan's point, we really encourage our staff when they see a request of that nature, I need to change my banking account information. I need you to go buy this. We really encourage them to call the person and say, hey, is this, is this legitimate? Are you really asking me to do this for that reason? So, and we, we do see staff getting much, much better at this as we go and as we go through more security training and things like that. Any other questions on security? I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to a different subject here. Okay. Oh, I have Commissioner Yamas. So I've, I've just been deleting things as they look. Do you still, at one point you had us um, sending them to you, right? Like this yeah, that's, that's correct. So in your Outlook, um, if you do have a message you believe is spam or phishing, there should be a report message button at the top. Yeah. Um, if you don't have it, we can get with you afterwards. I do have it. Okay, I, great. Sometimes I don't remember to do that. I just delete it. Yeah. You so know? what, and that's, that's fine. Um, that's absolutely fine. You can delete it, block it. The benefit of the report message button is it sends it to, our, to my team. So then we can see it. We can try to figure out how that message got through in the first place. And then we also report it to Microsoft um, so they can do their due diligence on it as well. So the other thing too, is we can see who else in the organization may have received that. Okay. So we, and then we can shoot out a warning message. Hey, you know, don't click on this. Okay. So yeah, definitely use the report message button if you can, but deleting it's always always going to be a good practice as well. All right. Okay. So switching over to some of our hardware and, and our replacement schedules, um, this chart kind of shows it very very easily here. So a lot of cell phones and laptops. Our desktop numbers are kind of starting to decrease. We're switching a lot of more staff over to laptops. The pandemic certainly had a lot to do with that. Um, mostly for our office staff. Laptops are really the way to go with their meetings and we're working remotely. Um, most of our desktops exist still out with our mechanics, um, but that number is slowly starting to fall. Um, digital signs and kiosks. Um, the digital signs, I'm sure you've seen the one out here in front of the boardroom or maybe some of the ones in the halls. Um, that's, that's what those are. The kiosk for, for drivers to sign in or clock in their time out in the yards um, and then servers and security cameras. So. Each year, we try to stagger our laptops and desktops, that refresh. Um, we try to make that number as equal as possible each year. Um, where we run into problems, and it's actually a good problem, is we run into grants that we receive that will pay for laptop or desktop upgrades. This year, we have our CMAC grant um, that our Traffic and Safety Department acquired. Uh, that's going to cover, I think, 17 or so laptops for them this year. So that kind of skews the numbers a little bit, but we try to make sure those numbers are are roughly even each year, both from a budget perspective and from a workload perspective and getting those out to our staff. Commissioner McCollum. Yes, I have a question. Um, the servers mm -hmm. are replaced every five to seven years. Is that because they're 
better servers after five or seven years, or they just run down after five or seven? Both. So we have the four physical servers in that hyperconverged infrastructure. Those those tend to run down. It's it's just like any hardware equipment; it'll run down over time. Um, the virtual servers that are on there are actually installed with the operating system. So the only way to replace that is to create a new one. But there, I mean, that's that's pretty easy. It's just like software; you're installing a new one. Um, you just need to purchase the new operating system. But for the you're you're exactly right. For the physical servers that we have. Um, it depends both on the, the age of the equipment and uh, it depends on the operating system because at some point Microsoft will go what they call end of life to where it's not supported anymore, which means it's not receiving security updates. So it'll still work, but it's no longer receiving those security updates or those patches each month. Um, and that's a big concern for us. So it, it really just, it, it mostly hinges on when that operating system goes end of life. Any other questions there? Software. Um, so each year we have a software budget or our subscription budget. These, these is our cost to maintain a lot of that software or those subscriptions. So we have over almost 1300 different applications that we monitor. Now it doesn't mean we're going through and looking at each one individually every day, but what it does is when we see vulnerabilities, when a, if some of our software pops up vulnerabilities or we see something in the news, we, we know we can search through our software very quickly and, and see, yep, we're affected here and here. It's installed on these machines. What do we need to do to take take action on that? Um, we spent, I, I think it was actually just under 160,000 this year is what we plan to spend. Um, that's on our core software. So those subscriptions to keep like our Office 365 running or our AutoCAD, um, WCRC Fix It is a big one. Um, and then any core licenses. So all, also on our server equipment, we have support packages. So. If something breaks on those pieces of equipment, we have those covered, the parts are covered, um, and the labor is covered to have somebody out here within six hours to have that equipment repaired. Um, so that's why you don't really see some of the redundancy like we have with the firewall on the, on the core switch. Essentially, the core switch is what we call a single point of failure. So what that means, if that, if that switch dies, or if there's an issue with that switch, it's gonna disrupt the organization. But instead of paying, you know, hundred to two hundred thousand dollars to have a second switch just waiting all the time. We've elected to go with a um, support model that has somebody out within six hours to repair that. Questions on software or subscriptions? Okay, this slide's fairly busy, but there's a lot of information on here. So switching over to our help desk, um, Josh Summerhill is our systems analyst. This is his primary focus. Um, I help him time to time but he does an outstanding job responding to our staff, getting solutions quickly to staff and uh, making sure that you know, things are kind of handled when, when staff need something. So um, on the chart on the left, you can see how many total tickets we've had over the last few years. You can see in 2016 when we weren't really using it and then it, how it kind of increases up to this year. So for this year in 2022, um, these number, numbers are only up to August 11th. Um, that's when I kind of put this together. I meant to go back and refresh it, but. Emily's team does too good a job of getting this out to you guys well enough in advance. And I, I dropped the ball on getting that number up, up uh, updated quicker. So, um, so these numbers are as of mid-August. We are trending towards that 1,200, 1,300, uh, 1300 uh, ticket mark for this year. Um, and our days to resolve average is very good. I think you can see there in 2018, um, prior to my arrival, that we were looking at about a week or more um, in getting a resolution to staff on some, frankly, very easy easy things. So um, Josh has really done an excellent job at helping to keep that number dropping each year. So um, over on the left, top right, you can kind of see a graph of those. Um, and then on the bottom right, that kind of shows our, our total ticket count per month. And I do kind of look at this a little bit. Um, the, the ups and downs are really kind of driven by a lot of our projects. Um, so if you see here on the orange, kind of in this range here, um, and I'll get into our team's phone system, but this is when we're rolling out our new, our new team's phone system. So when we roll out large projects, we, we start to see that increase, right? Until we see, or until we're able to train staff more or until people become more familiar with it. So we actually ended that project uh, just at the beginning of June and you can see where that kind of starts to drop off. So that's kind of the, hmm. kind of why that goes in waves there. Um, continuing with help desk, um, this kind of shows a breakdown of who's really ha handling the most tickets. And you can see Josh is 
way above Dan and I on this, which is excellent. That's what we that's what we have him here to do. Um, he's he's done an excellent job being that kind of frontline person for our staff to talk to when they have daily needs. Um, and then just some some other stats here. I love stats, so you can get a lot of them in this PowerPoint. But um, these are just uh, our top requests. So our assistance request or how to. That's really it's kind of our catch all, but it is a lot of what we see the most. Hey, I've got you know this problem. How do I do this? Um, that's really what we see the most of. With top of our problems, probably the next biggest one we see with upgrades or updates. It may it may break something minor or things like that, but. Uh, those are some of our biggest. Commissioner Doug Fuller, do you have a question? I did. Can we back up one slide? Yep. It's here. I noticed between 22 and 21, there was a significant difference in the number of tickets um, dropping as we move forward. Um, is that because people are getting better or are they just ignoring it? Well, as as I said earlier, that the twenty twenty two numbers are only as of mid August. Right. So, yes, people are getting better. Things are also changing every day too. Still, so I, I think the level of to where they're getting better with things is also is equal to things changing. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, the, the biggest difference here you see is just that the numbers for this year were only ran through August, and whereas last year was all of last. So you're year, projecting so. us to be about where we were at last exactly. year. Exactly. So I, I'm projecting if we go back one more. I'm projecting us to be about that, okay. that 1,200, between, you know, 1,000 and 1,500 again this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on help desk stuff? Okay. Um, going to some of our processes, these are really unchanged. Really the only different one here is our FOIA requests now go to our communications team. Um, we brought in a new software called Smarsh that does an excellent job of documenting our emails and our text messages. And now our, all of our team's instant messages too. Um, and we're able to kind of push that to our communications team and Emily and her team do an excellent job with pulling those uh, requests and the data and getting that out to the public. Um, other processes, um, all our new employees start with a computer on day one. Um, they're set up, we do a, a nice about a half hour to 45 minute orientation with them. Um, go through how to use it, go through IT security, um, get all their passwords in order, have them change passwords so they only only they know what it is. Um, any access requests, those have to go through department head. Um, a staff member can't just say, hey, I need access to this whatever folder. Um, and we give it to them. It has to be approved in writing by a director or whoever owns that folder. Um, referring back to our help desk for any technical needs, we instruct staff to either submit a ticket, email IT help, or call the number. Um, and the reason for that, one, it helps us document that request. Um, so if you have the same issue later, if someone else has that issue later, we can look back and see what we did for you. Um, it also helps if one of us is on vacation or like myself, I'm in meetings most of the day. If someone calls me directly, I'm probably not gonna get back to them until later that day or, th or the next day. So if you call the number, Josh is there most of the time, probably 99% of the time. Um, and if not, if you leave a voicemail, it sends it over to our ticketing system. We make sure that that request doesn't get lost anyway. So it really kind of helps us streamline and keep ourselves organized as far as requests go. Um, and then the last one there is for any terminated employees, somebody retires, um, HR sends us a ticket with their termination date and time. We make sure all their accounts are, are turned off at that retirement time, um, badge access, all that kind of stuff is, is removed. Any questions on process? But just a hypothetical. Uh, what is the what 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 is the protection against the vulnerability of say a disgruntled employee who might want to uh, hurt our hurt our IT system? So it, really, I would have to de defer to HR on that. Um, as far as IT is concerned, we wait for that ticket or email or, or phone call from HR that says, hey, we need to turn off all their stuff. And then we go through and make sure all that, all their access, their VPN access, their email, um, badge access, we make sure that's turned off whenever HR tells us to do so. But that is part of why we have this process in place. So it is seamless in the unfortunate circumstance should it arise if we're terminating an employee part of that termination process is to notify IT so they are 
um, you know, they do not have access to the buildings, to the IT, any of our, you know, IT infrastructure at all. So that is part of the process. And, and Nicole's done a nice, Nicole in our HR department's done a nice job with that too. I think in the four years we've been here, there's been one or two um, where she's given me a call and a heads up that says, hey, can you be available at one o'clock? And, and we can make sure that that's taken care of for her. So we kind of rely on HR to let us know when something like that's going to happen. Commissioner Fuller, I'm sorry, were you? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Picking up, and it may be part of Rod's question, because um, what I was thinking of when Rod was asking the question wasn't about terminated employees. What about employees who are here and are going, as far as we know, are going to stay? Who, what? If somebody is trying to create havoc within the system sure. and they're not terminated, where are we going to pick that up? We so that's one of the reasons we require management approval for certain access locations. First of all, um, should something like that happen, we do have the tools in place to see who and and where it was caused. Um, but we would ultimately look to our backups to restore whatever was damaged. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on processes? Okay. Uh, moving over to staff training. Um, like Dan said, we do want to put more of a focus on this next year. Um, I do think there are probably some tools that we are underutilizing at this point, um, things that we've brought in to kind of bring us up to speed in 2018, 2019. Um, our Office 365 suite being probably the biggest one of those with SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, so we do have a few plans to kind of use those a little more and, and provide some user training. Um, but the way we do most of our training, unless it's a big project, um, a lot of our training is done through what we call our IT power hours. It's usually around the lunch hour where people usually have a little free time. Um, that it's an optional jump in. We, we may present on a topic for 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for any questions or any dialogue. If anyone else has any, you know, hey, why well, do it this way? Um, it may be beneficial for person B to say, oh, I never thought of it doing that way. So um, this year we, we led power hours. Dan led one on precision. Um, and then I led one on our new Microsoft Teams phone system, which I can get, I'll get into here in a little bit. Um, and then also with training, like we touched on earlier, interim cybersecurity training. Um, that's a really good system. We've seen a lot of really good feedback with that. Um, staff are able to watch those videos on their own time when they have free time. They're not very long. They kind of keep your attention with the short two-minute videos. And then the, the quizzes, I, I don't think are too difficult, but... It, it makes sure that, that staff are actually watching the videos and, and gaining some information from them. Um, and then, like we touched on, we have the phishing tests as well. Okay. So switching over to projects. So this year for our completed projects, um, as Dan alluded to earlier, this boardroom was one of them. Um, we outfitted the room with cameras, microphones, all the monitors you see in front of you. Um, that was a really fun project to do. Um, Emily and her team are now able to stream you know, the working sessions and the board meetings um, over Zoom, and the public can participate from really wherever they are. The other room we did this year is our assembly room downstairs, which was really difficult to take a picture of because we it's so spread out and we put a lot of technology into that. That room is a very cool room. There's There are ceiling tiles, microphones. They're big square microphones that look like a ceiling tile. Um, and the way the array works, you can be standing on one end of the room and it, you sound exactly the same as if you're standing directly under it. It's really cool how it works. We can host Teams meetings down there. Uh, we have two different cameras. There's one on the front that you can see in this picture. Um, and then there's one on the side by the patio doors, um, depending on your meeting format or if you have a presenter um, or however you want to do it. We have microphones as well. We have a, a handheld and we have a lavalier that connects to your shirt collar if there's a presenter at the podium. Um, yeah, I, would, I would certainly be happy to show you that room. It's really hard to get into this PowerPoint, but it is a really cool room now. Commissioner McCollum. Yes, is that set up for hybrid also? Yes, so it works with Teams and Zoom. Oh, okay. Yep. And then uh, we could probably get it, I'll get a little out of myself, I guess. But yeah, so it's, it's a very cool room. We've, we've not been able to use it a ton for big meetings yet. We've used it for our supervisors' meetings a few times, and it's worked, worked very well. When you said Teams, I thought you meant that. It would be staff down there. And oh, I see. Talking. I see. I didn't think. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly can be. So we've had, like I said, our supervisors meetings where we've had probably 20 or so people in the room and then another 10 or so over Microsoft Teams um, with their faces up on the screen and 
you know, the voices come over the speakers. So it, it, it works very well. So we don't have to use the spaceship thing? Anymore? We don't. No, nope, that's correct. It was the quality on that. Was it, it worked pretty well, actually. That regular. Was, that was kind of a, you know, we've got this in the meantime as we're doing this room, but uh, that thing saved us more than a couple of times. So, <laughs> uh, but no, so it, yeah, the, there's two there's two ceiling mics. If you walk into the room, you'll see them up on the ceiling. Um, and they do a really good job of picking up where the, wherever the loudest um, voice is coming from. And it does a really good job too of picking up the voice. Say so it's picking up a voice from someone over here on the left and someone over here on the right is tapping their foot or you know, clicking a pen or ruffling through, through papers or things like that. It's really good at canceling that out and just pulling the voice. Um, another project we did, this was probably our biggest project of the year, was our phone system. So our Avaya IP office phone system that we've had um, for five or six years or so, um, pandemic really kind of showed us that that had a lot of issues with it. We had a few issues here and there before, um, and then you can see some of the, the items listed here. The biggest one is that it would crash on us all the time. Um, we were constantly frying the, the chip that was in there to handle voicemail. Why that was, I don't know, um, but we replaced that probably two or three times. Um, the, the system was constantly going down. And then when the pandemic hit, we had a lot of issues with staff working remotely, where we would try to twin their phone to their cell phone. And it just didn't, didn't work very well. It wasn't really meant um, for that purpose. Um, the other thing they had too with the Avaya system is there used to be a application that would plug into your Outlook that you could click to call your contacts. Mm -hmm. And at some point they took that feature away from us. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we did was we, we switched to, we already had Microsoft Teams implemented with our Office 365 suite. We we're already using it for instant messaging. And they added, they, they provide, Microsoft provides an add-on that is a full phone system. Um, so we, it kind of made sense to us. We already have this application. We're going to pay a little bit more a month and add that phone system onto it. So now the way it works is anyone with a Teams subscription on their laptop, wherever they are, as long as they have an internet connection, they can get a phone call right to their laptop. Um, there's also a smartphone app. So if they prefer to take the call on their smartphone, they can do that instead. So that really helped our field staff, um, our remote staff working from home. Um, they don't have to try to remember to, to set their phone on their desk twin. They can get in just from the app or from their computer and get to a lot of those settings that you have. Um, Commissioner yes. McCollum. Yeah, could you give me an example of the issues that you had prior to the new phone system where the calling the public was an issue. So we're calling the public is an issue is the staff, our staff would have to use their cell phone number to call the public. They didn't have a way to mask that number as the road commission. So then the public would call them back on their personal phone number. Right. Um, so what this team system allows us to do is it calls from their either their business line or the main line. And then they're not getting public calls up to their to their cell phone number after hours. So the display call shows the fifteen hundred number instead of their. It show it doesn't at the moment, um, but it shows their what was their extension. So it's, it shows their business number um, because there, there were some that were getting you know text messages from the public on their on their mm -hmm. line that weren't really going through the right process through the C click fix process or what whatever it may have been. Um, it's easier now that they kind of filter the, those public calls through their work phone number or through the, the main line phone number. So if you called someone, uh, pu uh, the public, what's it going to show up on the ID? It'll show as their work phone number. Their work phone number. Yep. Okay. So, okay. If, if, so oh, myself as, as IT manager, yes. If I, if I call a member of the public, it'll show as my full work phone number. Okay. Even if I, even if I call from my cell phone, if I call from the, the Teams app on my cell phone, it'll still show as my work phone number instead of my cell phone. Okay. What about us? You don't have the Teams phone system. We can <laughs> right. we can talk about that though. I don't want. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, commissioners are not set up. For it. Okay. So that's been a big improvement. Um, Chris, I, I, so, Commissioner Yamas, um, my question is: so if somebody if someone calls from their cell phone and a person calls back, it goes to their work extension or does it say, you it, know, like the, I think the hospital or something, it'll say something like that. The number that you're calling back on your caller ID is not sort of, uh, you have to call. It does, it goes back to their work phone number. Correct. So when anyone calls 
one of the business numbers in our organization, it'll it'll ring to the team's application on their computer and it'll ring to the team's application on their cell phone. So they can choose where they wanna answer that phone call. The biggest thing, the biggest thing we've seen with this phone system is there are far less outages. Um, because it's hosted with Microsoft, we don't have a box upstairs anymore that we need to maintain. So where we saw that issue with a buyer where it would crash all the time and we were constantly having people out to service that box, as long as our staff have an internet connection, they're able to take phone calls. Um, so it doesn't matter where they are, internet connection, you're going to get those phone calls. So that's the phone system is much more reliable now. Okay, so what about during a power outage? So that's a little tricky, right? So if there's a power outage in the main building here, they would still have the ability to answer phone calls from their cell phone because they would have a Verizon connection. Um, or they could go somewhere else, you know, if it's home or a lot of our foremen have the SIM cards in their laptops. So they could re receive a phone call that way. Um, or they, you could go, if you wanted to go over to McDonald's or the, the hotel next door and just grab their internet, that wherever you can find an internet connection and you can still be able to answer the phone calls. If you don't answer it, it's still going to go to your voicemail. Whereas when the Avaya system would go down or if there was a power outage, it would, you, that's when you would get the message, this phone number can't be reached. So now it's just going to treat it as if you didn't answer it. It's still going to go to your voicemail and then you'll still get an email with that voicemail in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, as long as they're able to obtain an internet connection from somewhere, they're able to answer those phone calls. The biggest thing is our cell phones, they're always going to have, well, not always, but most of the time they're going to have that Verizon connection that they'll be able to answer or make calls from the Teams app on their cell phone. Okay, so the only issue would be like most people, only if cell service went down everywhere, right? Correct. It would have to be cell service and our internet connection to the building. Some other projects we completed this year, I talked about the, the Datto solution already. Um, that's been a really great solution for our backups. Um, and then the other one I kind of touched on is our, the program is called Smarsh. Um, it's hosted in the cloud. That's what archives our emails and text messages. Um, for the purpose of FOIA requests. And that's what the communications team handles. A couple other minor projects. Um, our managed service provider applied innovations. Um, we had some issues. They, they provide our antivirus for us. It's included with our subscription. Previously, it was Silence Protect. Um, we ran into some issues with that where it was causing problems with some of the services on our servers running. Um, so we made the decision to switch to a new product called Sentinel One, and we've had much better experience with that. Um, and then the other one on the slide is we've had our digital signs now for going on three years, I think, three or four years, um, and we changed our software that we use to manage those. So you can kind of see this is our operations area. Um, they've got their weather and their their radars that they can see each day what's coming in, um, and then also also on the right they have the daily work schedule that scrolls. Um, they can see what each yard so our, our director of operations and his superintendents can see at a quick glance as they're walking by who's working on what and where and that's maintained by our communications team some ongoing projects so referring back to the slide about our replacement schedule for laptops so this is one of those years where we have a ton um, and like i said that was helped by our cmac grant so there are 33 that were Part of our annual refresh and then an additional 18 that were covered by the CMAC. So this is really being done by Josh Summerhill. He's doing an outstanding job of getting these out to everybody. That's a lot of computers and a lot of time uh, to get these up and going. I think per each computer, it's probably two hours to set up and then an additional half hour to an hour with the staff member as they make as he's making the switch and getting them comfortable with the new system. So he's doing an excellent job. He's about halfway through this year. We're still waiting on, we just ordered our CMAC laptops last month. Um, so those are slowly starting to trickle in, but um, unfortunately, with the way things are with the supply chain, those are going to be back ordered for a little while. We're hoping to still get them this year, but we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, as he's rolling these out, he's also turning on, what we talked about earlier, that second mode of authentication um, for our email accounts. And then at the end of the year, um, whoever did not receive a laptop will go through and make sure it's turned on for those as well. But the intent is by the end of the year to have multi-factor authentication turned on for everybody with a road commission email account. And then working with operations, those last three were improving security camera coverage here at the main yard. Um, we have a couple cameras that are kind of towards the end of their life. There's one on the back of the garage that 
goes out almost once a week anymore. Um, so the plan is to replace those with wider angle lenses. Um, they, they're actually 360 degree lenses, uh, but with where we're mounted, where they're going to be mounted, we're probably going to do about 180. Um, so there'll be one on the back of the garage there that'll face the salt dome, the, the gas station, and the, the green barn that's out back. Um, and then there'll be another two mounted on the corners of this building, it'll be the northwest corner and the southwest corner, so they can grab the whole parking lot. Currently, the cameras that we have are only zoomed up on the gates. We can only see who's coming in and out of the gates. We can't actually see the parking lots. Um, so just an added security measure. Um, it's really not hard if somebody from the public wanted to follow a truck in through the gate. So that's kind of the reason there. We're, we're, the cameras are due to re be replaced, so we want to make sure we can kind of increase that viewing area as well. Um, also in line with building security, we plan to add more proximity card readers to, to some doors, um, the biggest one being the elevator. So right now, if a member of the public walks into the building, um, they need a card to get in either the, to the permit side or to the administration side. Um, but if they go into the elevator, they can get anywhere they want to get. So that's not ideal. So that's probably the biggest one we're going to do. There's some other exterior doors that we'd like to put some more readers on, um, as well as some interior doors like our server room, um, our switch room, things like that. It's where our facilities team is still actually cutting keys and distributing keys um, for people to get into those rooms. So it's a lot of work for them to cut those keys. It's also hard for them to really know how many of those keys are out there. Um, should we need to remove access for somebody. So it's a lot easier with a card reader. We can get into the system, remove access to those badges. We can see what badges have access to the doors. Um, it's a lot easier to manage and maintain. And then the last item here is laptops for our group leaders. So our foreman, their laptops were upgraded this year as part of the replacement plan. Um, the plan is to then take their old ones and redistribute them to the group leaders. We're still putting a lot of kind of information or some planning behind that as to how that's going to work. A lot of those group leaders don't have an official office, so that adds a little bit of complexity to it. Um, but the plan is to redistribute those older ones to the group leaders, kind of see how that works, see if there's a good use out of them, um, and then eventually add them to the, the normal refresh schedule. Commissioner McCollum. Yes, um, so when you say computer upgrades, is that the same as refresh? It is, yep, sorry. No. Re refresh and upgrade, yep, they're the same thing. Okay. Chris, I, Commissioner Green also had. Yes. Go ahead, Rod. And the $80,000 for the annual refresh, is that out of our budget directly? Yes, I believe so. I'm, yes, I'm yes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions there? If not, I will switch to some extra projects. And this is actually my last slide. So um, next year, some more refreshes again. So we'll, we'll look to do 23 staff next year. Um, and then also all of our kiosks and our digital signs are due next year as well. We try to really be proactive with these as far as, or instead of letting them die first and then replace, um, because that just leads to more downtime for staff members. So that'll be for our PC refresh next year. Just like, and then just like we did this boardroom and the assembly room downstairs, this year, and then last year we did 200 and 234 upstairs. We were planning to upgrade equipment in room 106 over on the permit side. So that'll be a, essentially a mirror image of what 234 looks like. It'll have the sound bar underneath and the interactive display um, the, and the, the ability for Teams and Zoom remote meetings. Um, we're also looking into a self-service password reset option. This has been on here a couple years. And the reason for that is it really kind of feeds into the next bullet, which is a central document storage with Office 365. So we are looking at a way to, right now we have our X and W drive, which really houses all of our documents and that exists on our server. But with our Office 365 subscription, we have up to hundred gigs of free space available per user to store documents. And we kind of have documents in both places and a lot of staff aren't sure, you know, where's the official place to put this. Um, so next year, uh, we'll be putting a lot of thought and practice into creating a central document location through OneDrive and SharePoint, uh, essentially like an intranet. If you're familiar with most um, corporate organizations use an intranet where they can get it as a website where they can go through and they see quick links to different documents, things like that. So um, with that, it, it's going to change kind of how our computers are set up a little bit. And it may include that type of self-service password reset option, but um, we'd like to, with it, we'd like to include that option. So when staff, if they lock themselves out of their computer or for whatever reason they can't get in, um, they'll have some preset 
security questions that they can just answer and then it'll allow them to unlock their account rather than needing to call us during normal business hours. So we've had some guys on the weekends in the winter, some group leaders that maybe don't use the computer all the time, forgot their password, get in, lock themselves out and then can't get a hold of anybody to unlock it. So that'll be a good, good tool for them. Commissioner McCollum, did you have a question? Um, I did. I wanted to know what our kiosks were. The kiosks are, you can actually see one out in this back hallway if you'd like. Those are just our computers at each yard. Um, some yards have more than others, um, but they're the way for our drivers to punch in and punch out. Oh. Their, their time clock. Oh, the time clock. That's what yep. it is. Okay. Yeah, we would, sorry, we refer to them as the key or the time card kiosk. Okay. Kiosk is short. I'm a little old school. <laughs> um, and then the last two on here, so we also wanna have a third party security audit. So while we feel our controls are really good um, and they're you know, double checked and advised by our managed service provider, we'd still like to have a third party come in and essentially see if they can hack our system. And if so, how did they get in? What, what methods did they use? And where, where are our vulnerabilities? Kind of from a third party, someone that's not seen our network or our infrastructure before. Where in the world do you find those people? They exist. Um, actually, one, I believe, Plant Moran, <laughs> our, our auditors use something and have recommended. Interesting. Yep. So that'll be exciting kind of see, you know, where can we improve or what haven't we thought of? And then just, it really is just going to strengthen our security. And then the last item is we're going to look, we're looking at currently with our finance department, an automated workflow system um, that'll kind of get away from some more paper or you know, editing of PDFs. There'll be some fields people can fill in and it automatically goes to the finance team or you know, HR or wherever it needs to go to um, get rid of some of that paper trail of handing things back and forth um, to make things a lot easier. I know our shop still uses uh, paper tickets for, each, for their vehicles and things like that. So it'd be nice to kind of get a lot of that automated and to be able to send it to the right person or whichever team it needs to go to. So more to come on that. We've, wow. we've just started looking into that probably within the last two weeks, but um, we're hoping to have that on the schedule for 2023. With that, mm -hmm. I am finished. If there are any other questions on anything, I'm happy to go back. And, and like I said, if, you, if you'd ever like to see anything, well, my, my doors open upstairs. I'm happy to show you some more of the, the inner workings or some of the nuts and bolts of things. Or if you, frankly, if you just want to see this, the server room, it's kind of neat to see. We've got our traffic center in there too. So Very to tidy. It is exciting. So. All right, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is a break. So I think what we'll do is go ahead and take a 15 minute break, just give people a chance to stretch their legs um, and then come back in at 1015 and we'll have a closed up session to go into at that time. So after the break, we'll move to go into a closed session. Well, that upstairs. Yes, but we'll have to move. Oh, no, no. Locate upstairs. Correct. All right, we're in recess here for fifteen minutes. All right, we are returned from our brief break, and at this time, I entertain a motion to begin our scheduled closed session under Section 8C of the Open Meetings Act to receive an update from the TPOAM contract negotiations. Aaron, if you- I'm sorry? I said I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Is there a second? I support. Thank you. Aaron, if you would please call the roll. Commissioner Douglas Fuller? Aye. Commissioner Gloria Yamas? Yes. Commissioner Joanne McCollum? Yes. Commissioner Rod Green? Yes. And Commissioner Barb Fuller? Yes. And Emily will briefly give some instructions to anyone who's not eligible to be in the closed session. Thanks, Commissioners. So for virtual participants, if you're not a road commissioner or a designated staff member, I'll now move you to the virtual waiting room. If you'd like to be returned to the open session of the meeting once we've completed the closed session, please remain in the waiting room. I will readmit you once the closed session has been completed. For in-person attendees, please exit the boardroom unless you're a designated staff member or commissioner. You're welcome to wait in the lobby until the closed session has been completed. Okay, commissioners, uh, recording has resumed and uh, Commissioner Sanders rejoined us from the waiting room. We are good to start whenever you are. Thanks, Emily. Uh, we have 
concluded our closed session and I would ask, I ask for a motion to end our closed session. So moved. Support. Aaron, if you would please call the roll. Commissioner Gloria Yamas. Yes. Commissioner Joya McCollum. Yes. Commissioner Rod Green. Yes. Commissioner Douglas Fuller. Aye. And Commissioner Barb Fuller. Yes. There is no further business for this working session. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Support. If you would please, Aaron. Commissioner Rod Green. Yes. Commissioner Gloria Yamas. Yes. Commissioner Joya McCollum. Yes. Commissioner Douglas Fuller. Aye. And Commissioner Barr Fuller. Yes. We are adjourned. We will reconvene at one o'clock for our regular meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner.